Good evening and welcome to this new episode of the series. The title of this video is Incomplete. I shortened it because reading a long title may be confusing. But it should really be My Road to Damascus, Deadly Medicines and Organized Crime. Which, by the way, Deadly Medicines and Organized Crime is also the title of a hefty book written by an investigative Danish doctor called Peter Getzke. It is not, it was not an easy good to read, at least, at least for me. There are almost 1,000 cross-references to other books and publications to corroborate and to support the data provided, provided in the main section of the book. Now, given the volume, I could only verify or check few cross-references, but even this limited number of verified cross-references inevitably slow down the reading. Furthermore, Furthermore, I had to find the meaning of several terms connected with pharmacology and with, with medical statistics, term, terms that were unknown to me. Many names of the quoted medicines and their applications were also unknown to me. For most of them, I had to find out what they meant, or, though most have no meaning, as you know. They are just an assembly of vowels and consonants I had to find what, they were, what were they originally used for or applied to and cross-reference them throughout, throughout the various chapters. Because, in some cases, the same medicines were or are used for totally different conditions than those they were officially approved for. Incidentally, using a pill for something it was not approved for originally, I learned, is called off-label application. Yet, I vaguely recalled the names of some of these medicines for having heard them before, years back, when occasionally I was still listening to the news on corporate television, where the commercial breaks were, and maybe still are, mostly dedicated to promoting this or that pill. And how and how these medicines I saw advertised on TV were touted, touted as almost miraculous only to be later withdrawn from the market due to their deadly consequences or side effects, as they euphemistically are called. By the way, the invasion of medical pills advertising is creeping aggressively also on the Internet. And this investigation of mine has equally made me realize the ominous, the ominous meaning of the encouragement or suggestion inserted in the various, at the end of various medical advertisements, ask your doctor about pill such and such. Actually, actually, based on the findings reported in the book I mentioned, it can safely be concluded that the call to ask your doctor about pill such and such, more than an encouragement, it almost partakes of criminality, if people and patients at large only knew what is behind the benign and almost altruistic tone of the television advertisement. It is as sincere as Richard III encouragement to keep the young princes of Wales, the, the, the two princes, one of which was the legitimate heir to the throne in the Tower of London, the throne of England, who is subsequently killed along with his younger brother. Still, given this somewhat lengthy introduction, how does the road to Damascus have or has anything to do with all this? The road to Damascus referred to my personal experience as regards the subject at large, the subject of the presentation, which is actually allopathic medicine, that is, medicine based on drugs. In fact, in fact, it may even be a stretch to call it a Damascene experience because for a long, long time I vaguely entertained the same thoughts and skepticism towards allopathic and therefore corporate medicine, before I gathered thoughts and experiences, I may say, into a structure that I could find logical enough so that it made sense to myself and hopefully to others. Personally, I do not use medicines, nor I sincerely remember the last time I took one. Now. For the life of me, for the life of me, I am not, 
have not been, nor pretend to represent an exception, endowed with special powers to prevent illness and to ensure health. I have been ill at times, but the gods, the gods were sufficiently gracious as to spare me, at least, at least for the time being. Nevertheless, nevertheless, however obvious it does not hurt, it does not hurt to remember that all that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity, as Gertrude says to Hamlet. And here is another quote. What is pomp, rule, reign, but earth and dust, and live it as we may, yet die we must. Which is, by the way, what the Duke of Warwick says or utters before dying after being mortally wounded in the Battle of Barnet in the saga of Henry VI. Furthermore, I have deep respect and boundless admiration for all those doctors and surgeons, I call them the Michelangelos of medicine, especially those who rescue people from the brink of death following traumas and accidents of all sorts. My original skepticism about allopathic medicine, that is, medicine based on drugs, has to do with the outcome or the very bad treatment given in the past to some persons who were very dear to me. Nevertheless, nevertheless, several years ago, hoping to reduce, to reduce the chasm of my, the chasm of my medical ignorance, to use a metaphor, I decided to pass the exam of medical interpreter for Spanish in the instance, and I have attended and therefore translated about 2,000 patient doctor sessions. And by so doing, I have also learned something on how the system of insurance work in the United States. In essence, provided that the income of the patient is sufficiently low, and the level is set very low, the state, in this case Oregon, intervenes with various schemes to provide essential medical insurance and to pay the providers. In many cases, my translations occurred when the patient was being prepared for surgery, sometimes during surgery when the patient was not completely uh, anesthetized, or later when he, when he or she returned for a follow-up after, after surgery. For example, in the cases of hernias, cysts, gallstone, spinal disc problems, but also interventions in the brain as a prevention or removal of aneurysms or similar. And there was one recent session that particularly prompted me to gather the material related to the general subject to gather it into a presentation. Material, no doubt, thoroughly incomplete, and yet, I hope, informative, at least for some. I apply to it, to this, to this presentation, I mean, what Dr. Johnson said of dictionaries, though none is perfect, any is better than none. The case in question involved a woman, a woman from South America, who was working in the care facilities and fell while delivering meals. After the fall, her back and one knee were hurting badly, and I was called to interpret after the patient had already undergone X-rays and MRI, which stands, as you know, for magnetic resonance imaging. These were the examinations she, she undertook. She had referred to this specialized spinal cord clinic by her primary doctor. And I described the phases of the session because, from my experience, they may apply to other cases, at least based on what I could observe as, as an interpreter. First, in came a nurse to measure weight, height, heart and blood pressure of the patient. And the next to visit was a medical assistant because, in the instance, the surgeon was too busy for, at the moment anyway. The medical assistant showed the patient the X-ray images pertaining to her case, which indicated a degradation in one of the discs between two vertebrae. The solution, he said, would be a surgery during which two small screws would be inserted between the vertebrae surrounding the affected disc. What made the session particularly noteworthy, in my view, were two events not strictly related to, diagno to, the, to the diagnosis, one amusing, the other indicative of a culture that, also described in the book that I mentioned at the beginning, seems to be widespread. 
All the patients I interpret for are, in general, very respectful, submissive, trusting, and grateful for whatever the doctors, assistants, or nurses would tell them or suggested to them. The patient in question was the proverbial and somewhat theatrical, theatrical exception. As soon as the medical assistant mentioned the word surgery, which she understood in the original English even before I translated, she delivered what could, what could be described a howl of anguish. Surgery, she said, nunca in Spanish, never in English. The assistant was taken somewhat aback by the scream, and after a few seconds, the patient asked if she could speak with the doctor she was originally referred to, because, because, among other things, in order for her to continue with her medical leave, she needed the clinic to fill in some paperwork verifying her medical, her medical condition. This, however, was not possible, the medical assistant said, because the doctor surgeon was busy and given that the patient refused surgery, her interchange with the surgical clinic was therefore coming to an end, it was concluded. However, the patient came from quite far away and it was painful for her to walk. However, and fortunately, fortunately, the assistant realized the awkwardness, the awkwardness of the situation and said that he would search for the doctor surgeon. In fact, both returned after a few minutes. And here, I think, is the interesting part. The patient explained to the doctor that her back was yes hurting, but in equal, if not greater pain, was it one of her knees. She had mentioned, she had mentioned about the pain in the knee before to the assistant, but he had, I could say essentially, dismissed the patient's complaint, suggesting that the knee pain could be likely be caused, could be, could be likely caused by the disc condition in the context of the suggested surgical intervention, intervention on the spine. At this point, the doctor visually examined her knee and concluded that the problem was not with her spine, but with her knee, which the knee was not his specialty. Consequently, he would recommend to her a knee specialist, he did not say surgeon, perhaps pre-warned, pre-warned by the assistant about the patient's reaction to the word surgery, and as for the pain, he suggested a visit to a pain clinic that he, would, that, he, that he would also recommend. Now, somewhat less agitated than previously, the patient volunteered to say that her primary doctor had prescribed a drug whose name she did not recall exactly, but it was quickly recognized by the assistant as gabapentin, and I will get to this later and that the pill had relieved the tingling and prickly sensation she felt in the leg of the hurting knee. Both assistant and surgeon then suggested that she continue taking the pill, I mean this pill called gabapentin, which, as I learned later, is a drug originally approved to treat epilepsy. Nevertheless, they did not fill the required paperwork, and the South American patient probably had to lug herself to some other medical establishment to have that done. Still, the somewhat theatrical, I would call it Moliere-esque episode as in Moliere, the French playwright, prompted me to find out something about gabapenting, considering that the term, however meaningless in itself, still contained, contained a manageable assortment of consonants and vowels that in some measure facilitate, or for me, facilitate the memorization. To begin with, the drug gabapentin also goes by another name, neurontin or neurontin. It's not that funny, but I am tempted to paraphrase a quote from Romeo and Juliet. Gabapentin, by any other name, is just as bad. In fact, in 2004, Pfizer agreed to plead guilty to two felonies and pay the small sum of $430 million to settle charges that it fraudulently promoted the epilepsy drug, neurontin and or gabapentin, for unapproved uses. In the case in question, the company Whistleblower did receive $27 million, which is not a bad sum. Yet the fine was a small, considering, considering that the sales of gabapentin were two billions and seven mil seven hundred million dollars in 2003. 
and as about 90% of the sales were for, as they said, they call it off-label use, meaning not related to epilepsy, the fine did not have any deterrent effect as proven in the case I witnessed 18 years later. The South American patient did not suffer from epilepsy symptoms, by the way, nor had a history of any epilepsy episodes based, based on her medical history chart which I helped her compile before the visit. As it is well known, epilepsy is a condition commonly and universally associated with nervous system problems, meaning with the brain. And, and ironically, as I was researching the term gabapentin on the internet, a chat box from a company called Balboa Horizons spontaneously showed up on screen telling me, I am here to help you and assist you to in finding a detox or rehabilitation center. No thank you, I typed, though instinctively my reaction was to type something more uneducated. Still, in other words, neurontin gabapentin is a narcotic. It is prescribed to treat, and I read, nerve pain, alcohol and cocaine withdrawals, rested leg syndrome, the tingling of which the patient complained, diabetic neuropathy, fib fibromyalgia and seizures. Again, I read and unquote, it works by altering one's calcium, it works by altering one's calcium channels to reduce seizures and ease nerve pain. The drug's known street name are Gabby's and Johnny's. Not much mental effort, therefore, is needed to realize the nature, the nature of the remedy. Furthermore, and again quoting, in addition to its potentially addictive nature, gabapentin can cause suicidal thoughts, mood swings, and abrupt changes in a user's behavior. It can also cause elevated blood pressure, fever, sleep problems, appetite changes, and chest pain. And, and, a 2013 study in Kentucky found out that of the 503 participants reporting illegal drug use, 15% reported using gabapentin, in addition to other drugs to get high during, during the previous six months. And another study working with a sample of participants meant to represent the, the national population found almost that, that almost a quarter of the patients with co-prescription of opioids and gabapentin were getting more than three times, three times their prescribed amount to supply, to supply their addiction. Due to, the, due to the drug's legal status, the study concludes, this is difficult to address from a standpoint of policy, which is a euphemism for making the drug, for making the drug illegal. Still, so they can't make it illegal. Still, as I read, states where gabapentin abuse is becoming more common are beginning to classify the drug as a more strictly controlled substance. Gabapentin's unique ability to address, to address multiple ailments has made it one of the most popular prescription medications in the United States, so I learned. And in May of 2019, an outfit called Good RX reported that it was the fifth most prescribed drug in the nation. By the way, by the way, Good RX is an American healthcare company that tracks prescription drug prices in the United States and provides drug coupons for discounts on medications. Side effects of gabapentin overuse, however overuse may be may be measured, are drowsiness coordination problems, tremors, dizziness, depression, suicidal thoughts and behaviors, changes in mood, dizziness, poor coordination, forgetfulness, anxiety, difficulty speaking, inability to feel pleasure. Now, I am not judging but raising a question. Is it reasonable, advisable, or for that matter healthy, to prescribe what is essentially an addictive drug for a tingling in the leg? as it was the case for the South American patient. Yet, gabapentin is also listed in the medicine listed as prescribed for more than 48 off-label uses, and Medicaid is obliged to pay for the drug being prescribed for all these 48 uses rather than the original use 
which, as I said, is or was epilepsy. Now, at this point I wanted to know a bit more about Drug Dex, the outfit that I've just mentioned. The company sells medical education, and the common practice of Drug Dex and other similar companies is to plant salespeople in doctors' offices under a program euphemistically called preceptorship, making it appear as if the doc is training a medical student. Apparently, at least reading in the book, the patients are not even aware that the salesperson is or may not be a medical student, not even in cases when they are examined, for example, as mentioned in the book, for breast cancer. And this is what a company executive told the salesperson, and this I quote from the book. Dinner programs, continuing medical education programs, consultantships all work well, but don't forget the one-to-one -one method. That is where we need to be, holding their hands and whispering in their ear, neuronting for pain, neuronting for monotherapy, neuronting for bipolar, neuronting for everything. I don't want to hear that safety crap. And I interject here, I assume that by safety crap the company executive refers to the use of neuronting gabapentin as a drug to give the user a high. Incidentally, much of the illegal promotion of, of, of neuronting gabapentin took place at meetings that were support, supposed, or rather supported and supposed to educate doctors and patients. A physician whistleblower testified that, at some neuronting meetings, the company paid not only the speakers, but also the listening doctors, treating them to luxury trips to Hawaii, Florida, and other places. It was very easy to corrupt doctors, the whistleblower said, of a 40 influential so-called thought leaders identified as potential speakers in the northeastern United States, including 26 current or future department chairs, vice chairs and directors of academic clinical program division and so forth, no fewer than 35 participated in the company sponsored activities in honoraria or grant. One doctor in the instance received almost $308,000 to tout Neurontin at conferences. The speakers were furthermore updated on the company's promotional strategies and the company eventually, and the company which was called Warner Lambert, which was later purchased by Pfizer. The company tracked high volume prescribers and rewarded them as a speakers or consultants or for recruiting patients in their studies. Doctors were also paid to lend their names to ghostwritten articles, meaning written by someone else, purporting to show that neurontin gabapentin worked for unapproved conditions. And the professor requested, requested and received over $300,000 to write a book on epilepsy which, as I mentioned, was the original condition for which the drug was approved. One internal document obtained through US court proceeding stated that medical education drives this market. A simple statement in itself, but that, in my opinion, should send cold shivers to potential patients at large, considering that it applies to a major provider of one of the current vaccines. Other internal documents show the extent to which the company was willing to distort the evidence, and in relation to the legal marketing, the company had a publication strategy. The results, if positive, will be published immediately, and I think that we can limit the potential downside of the, in this instance, 224 negative studies by delaying the publication for as long as possible. And again, reading from the book I mentioned, the manipulation also involved selective statistical analysis, selective reporting of outcomes that happen to show a positive effect, inappropriate exclusions or inclusions of patients in the analysis, multiple publication of desirable results, differential citation of Pfizer results, and ways to make negative results appear positive. This bias, this bias was already introduced at the design stage that is, using higher doses than what the doses would be in the final product, 
In other words, delivering more potent narcotic highs leading to buyers reporting of subjective outcomes. Meaning, the higher the dose of the narcotic, the better you feel. I will end this episode with a quote from an American author, Upton Sinclair, that applies at large not only to allopathic medicine. A person can hardly be forced to understand something when his salary depends on the fact that he does not understand. In fact, understanding reality faces many obstacles. It is not natural to think that doctors, health professionals, hospital workers, drug manufacturers and researchers have no interest in making us healthy, yet their survival is linked precisely to the fact that we are sick, that we are declared sick, or that we are always afraid of being sick. In the next episode, I will continue to review instances of gross manipulation of information on the safety of medicines and treatments, or lack thereof, as well as the sociological conditions and culture that make all this possible. Until then, thank you for watching and, as always, may all the number of the stars give light to your fair way. Good night.